Is there something to be said on a philosophical level about the value of a flawed robot? So like the kind of robots you want is to be partially flawed. Like, do you think the kind of robots we'll have in the home mm -hmm. that are friends and, um, you know, almost like pets, wouldn't they need to be kind of shitty because we can love the, somehow we humans love the shitty. I mean, it is kind of endearing and cause I think it, it kind of, I'm going to mess up this world word. I anthropomorphizes them. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I mean, I never feel as deeply connected to my Roomba as when it's like, I'm on a cliff. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, babe. Have you had Roomba's talk? Tiny ledge. No. So I really, yeah, I've done that a lot. Yeah. When they talk to you. Yeah. And it, it, it immediately anthropomorphize them. Yeah. And then you have, if they have a name, which is why most roboticists don't give names or gender to robots because you, you, you become connected to them. I'm of the opposite mind. You should have like an in, intimate relationship sounds weird, but you should have a close <laughs> connection to robots. I mean, there there's power in that. There's a social element to robotics, even a arm. I don't know. There's something about us humans that gains so much value from our interaction with dynamic objects. And we should like lean into that as opposed to run away from it. That, that was always the confusing thing to me about robotics is that most roboticists run away from that. Yeah. It's weird. Cause it's obviously gonna be, robots are obviously going to be everywhere. Yeah. Obviously. But it's also humans are sensitive and squishy and there's so much liability. Oh. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, but the, the humans are sensitive and squishy when they interact with each other and they hurt each other all the time. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they get together and they're like, oh, you're the best. You no, know, you're the best. And then they leave each other and then they break each other's heart. Sorry about your breakup, Lex. I didn't yeah, know I'm you just were trying to get over this. <laughs> I'm actually drunk for this interview. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been able to Have sleep for nights. Have you slept nights. all night? I have yeah. not. But from a safety protocol perspective, people think about like physical damage, not emotional damage. I know this sounds ridiculous. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it won't be. It's already happening. There's an app called Replica where people have an intimate relationship with an AI chatbot and they hurt themselves. I was thinking about this. Yeah. Okay. In dating, mm -hmm. what if you, because you can train like a chatbot to kind of mimic the way that you talk to people and interact with people. Go on. Yeah, but then I'm like, okay, but what if we could all make AI versions of ourselves and have them date yeah. like thousands and thousands of other AI people and have that as a way to churn out potential potential candidates? Like, I feel like that's gonna be what's the what's the yeah what's the what <laughs> no, but what's <laughs> the point of like meeting? 20 people if you're like oh but if we just had our ai versions of ourselves interact they'd be like oh your your method of conflict is not going to match or what if the ai version of you like sleeps around with all the other ais and becomes famous for that and it starts its own only fans and then it become and you're like what did you do you come yeah. back home you'd realize like i don't i didn't want to create a monster create a monster i and mean then... do i get a cut <laughs> exactly that's the question <laughs> yeah. i would be asking but I think it's definitely like, yeah, the, the human technology interaction is really interesting because I feel like I don't love any of the machines that I have in my life. Oh, really? You haven't, you haven't? I mean, I don't love my phone. I touch it all the time and it's there and it's like constantly, it's a constant presence, but there's nothing in me that feels like, oh, I love this object. So like I kind of despise it. Well, that, that might be the way you show love. I don't know. Yeah, that's a deeper. Yeah. That's another psychoanalysis thing. Uh, so you don't. There's not robots whom you've taken apart that you miss. No, they're all terrible. I mean, I I have objects that I built that I love. Mm -hmm. um, none of the robots, I think, but that's also because it was a different. That was a different era where I wasn't really putting a lot of care into the projects I built. So the more care you put into it, into the design, to actually make it look to make it functional and look good, that's where you put the love in. Yeah. I mean, it is. It's like, I feel like any technology company that figures out a way to get you to actually genuinely love your Roomba or like love it in the way that you would love a pet, there's a lot to be gained. Yeah. And I think it's scary mm -hmm. depending on who the company is because mm -hmm. then they can manipulate you. Yeah. 
if you, if you love your Roomba, and all of a sudden your Roomba starts telling you to buy stuff. Yeah. Or it's to, leaving. To put lotion on Jeff Bezos' head. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where the lotion came in, but yes, maybe a pie certain. I just, <laughs> just imagine my Amazon Echo being like, hey. <laughs> hey. Jeff Bezos is really a great guy. <laughs> <You're> just... <laughs> but even though you haven't, do you think it's possible to fall in love with a robot? Yeah. I mean, people fall in love with things all the time. Well, people have fallen in love with your shitty robots, probably. I, I guarantee you there's people listening to this that are a little bit heartbroken saying that you've never fallen in love with your shitty robot. <laughs> They're like, but I had a relationship, like I had an <laughs> emotional connection to that robot. Like the one with it with a parent, pats you on the back. Oh, that one. That one I do like. I like that one a lot. Um, that's probably my favorite, like, shitty robot. Can you explain it? So it's a machine. It was my friend Daniel Beauchamp and I. We had this long-running joke about a proud parent machine that you could give a quarter and it pats you on the shoulder and says, proud of you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I still have that hanging on my wall in my workshop. So that one I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with. I just think it's a really funny concept and also i executed the build well so that was so it's an arm mm -hmm. like what's the build yeah i built it off of an old lamp arm yeah basically it's just a motorized arm and this kind of torso of of a person mm -hmm. what's well, so, so it's actually a hand right it's not a, correctly it's, it's, it's like a laser cut it's just laser cut plywood and it kind of has like it, it looks creepy yeah which i like yeah, the creepy yeah. helps with the... Yeah. And yeah, it says, proud of you, son. Because I just thought that sounded more funny than proud of you, daughter. And also, proud of you, son, just... It immediately communicates that it's a parent. It's not just like a collie or something. It's like, proud of you. <laughs> yeah. And it charges you a quarter for it. Yeah, but he added like chat GPT on top of that and uh, fine tune it on conversations you've had with your parents. And all of a sudden, you have a thing... It can fundamentally transform your psyche. Yeah. That's all it takes. That's a beautiful creation. How'd you come up with that creation? Oh, it was my friend Daniel and I who had a long running joke about it. High level, can you speak to your creative process? I think a lot of it, I mean, it's changed. For the Shady Robots, that's actually separate. For the separate. Shady Robot, yeah. I mean, it, it has a lot of overlap. Um, so it's identifying everyday problems. And in the Shitty Robot era, I would kind of take an everyday problem like, oh, I have a hard time getting up in the morning and I would solve it in the most ridiculous, spectacular way I could think of. So for waking up in the morning, it was having an alarm clock that slaps me in the face with a rubber hand. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing now is still identifying everyday problems, but I'm actually trying to like product design my way out of it. What in your experience was the funniest thing? Is it violence, like the hand slapping you? food eating is there is, or is it just a uh, case about the it? funniest is no i think it's more like the proud parent machine it's not violent it doesn't yeah, there's no nothing it's just emotional and it's yeah. kind of a commentary on this fraught relationship that we sometimes have with our parents and they're proud of us sometimes every time sometimes my dad visited like last week and he was like i just want to say i'm so proud of you and for the built life you built for yourself and that yeah. was really sweet yeah i'll really put kind. that on the back of my autobiography too yeah it's not your fault simone <laughs> it's not your fault some stuff is my fault <laughs> what was the longest one to complete for the shady robots that you remember because you spent on a few of them you spent quite a long time mm -hmm. mm. which is also inspiring when you take so long in a project yeah i think um Kind of in the more like fun, whimsical department rather than shitty robots. I built recently um, this music box. So like a small music box that kind of has a barrel mm -hmm. with little spikes and it plays a song. But I did a large version of that that pops a sheet of bubble wrap and then like plays tones into a pan flute. So yeah, you can actually program it to play different songs. That one kicked my butt in so many creative ways and it was such a pain. I think that is probably the like weird funny project that's taken me the longest and like the biggest engineering effort where's the all sound coming from so if you it all came from me realizing that if you pop bubble wrap and you pop it right in front of the opening of a pan flute or like one of the pipes you can have it play different tones 
So that's what it does. So I built this music instrument off of that. Okay. It, if it's okay, can you describe some, some like how it works, some of the, the, the technical details here? Yeah, it's so basically, I mean, one of the big issues that I had, so I worked with, um, as of a year and a half back, I hired an engineer, Stu, so we were collaborating on it. Um, but a big issue that we had was feeding in the bubble wrap sheet and like uh-huh. making sure that it feeds in straight and doesn't get skewed because you need to make like the popping feet which is where you program this barrel to pop different bubbles need to be so perfectly aligned on the bubble of the bubble wrap for it to pop in the right location. So there's a feeder for the bubble wrap. That's a challenge. And then mm-hmm. you have to have a barrel with the f- little baby feet on it yeah. that pops the bubble so wrap. That Why is it so exciting? That barrel <laughs> was a <laughs> pain yeah. as well. I had to get a like this rotary set up for my CNC and yeah, it was it was a lot of work. Um but that was really fun and it's just like this is probably my f- favorite privilege of my job is that I can go down any rabbit hole I think find interesting. Did you have a lot of joy from popping the Mhm. The, yeah, that's fine. The bubbles. It's a lot of self-soothing. And like I got to spend, I think I spent a week trying to figure out the best material to pop bubble wrap with. Because if you have two, if you kind of put them to, to through uh, or through, if you put a sheet of bubble wrap through two rigid tubes, mm-hmm. the air kind of just escapes from one side of the bubble into the other. So yeah. what I realized was that if you have a squishy material, like kind of a yoga mat material, mm-hmm. in between it, it actually it prevents that and pops it a lot more reliably. So but you, like increasing the pop reliability was a huge effort as well. You have to pop a squishy thing with another squishy thing. Because you don't need a lot of force. Yeah. Like you just need it to not, the air to not be able to escape anywhere. Wow. But then also we had, there was different qualities of bubble wrap where there was a lot of transference between different bubbles. So instead of the bubble popping, it would just seep the air into a neighboring bubble and that like membrane would kind of. So, you know, I I just like getting to spend weeks on weeks of just studying bubble wrap. (laughs) Did you ever think about like publishing academic work on bubble wrap? No. Wouldn't that be epic? Because nobody's done this. I bet you nobody's done squishing it. Squishy material on squ- squishy versus squishy <laughs> for popping. I bet somebody has, but you know, I I always I thought I was going to go into academia. Like I was such an ambitious student. I loved school. I I actually applied to MIT, but then I pulled out because I was like, no, I don't want to do it. Um, but now I realize it's really good that I didn't because I'm too much of a spaz. Too much of a spaz. Now yeah. I'm, I'm distracted. I'm thinking there must be papers about <laughs> when you have two bubbles. Yeah, you need to know the physics of two bubbles. When when you have two bubbles colliding, one will pop first, and there has to be good models of that. But that's very that has to do with chemistry and whatever the the material the bubble is made from. But then no, there's materials engineering. There's got somebody must understand bubble wrap deeply. Like deeply. So I'm just going to take a quick restroom break because uh, Lex is on his own train now. <laughs> and I'm just going to leave you and to talk about bubble. Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't need to go to the restroom. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm going to insert like a two hour uh, instructional here with like a blackboard where I. It's the skill of a podcaster. It's, I feel like I could throw you any topic and you could just go on about it. I don't know if I have that skill. I just <laughs> yeah, love like bubble wrap. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, bubble and, on bubble <laughs> and interaction. Go. 